This is Near Death TV. I'm your host, Laura Ketchledge. I'm also an author. In 1979, I became a near-death experiencer. I chose to explain the truth I learned about the afterlife, reincarnation, and near-death experience through my fictional book series, The Near Death Saga. While dead, I was shown all human beings are shrouded in ignorance by design in order to learn valuable lessons in each incarnation. When you die, the artificial facade falls away and we awaken from the dream into reality. For more information, you can find us at neardeathtv.com. Please join us as we explore the after effects of near-death experience. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Near Death TV. I'm your host, Laura Ketchledge. Today, I'm really thrilled to have a special guest. His name is Stephen Weber, and he's the co-author of the best-selling book, The Place Between Here and There. Hi, and welcome to the show, Steve. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and your audience. Well, I've got some very dedicated fans that are here to learn about near-death experience and its after effects. You know, I'm going to dive right in today, Steve. You know, I know that you're an educated man, um, family man, had a good profession. What happened when you went into that deep coma and when did this occur? Okay, it happened back in, uh, I guess, uh, 2015. It was, uh, it was uh, 2015, I was driving my motorcycle one day and I was broadsided by a truck. It hit me on the left side of my body. Uh, yeah, almost all my bones were broken. I broke my spine. I had a traumatic brain injury. I had a shattered hip, broken arm, broken leg, internal injuries. Yeah, I could go on and on. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the doctor once told me, uh, this, this medical report is usually an op autopsy report. So, so it, was, it was something that was very, uh, people usually do not survive from this type of an accident. It just so happens uh, uh, they were able to airlift me to one of the best trauma centers in the United States, Stony Brook University Hospital. And they are, they are miracle workers there. They put me back together again. It was, uh, it was an amazing experience. And in many ways, it was the very best experience of my life. I was, uh, I was in my hospital bed. I was in a coma for three weeks. They had to do several emergency uh, surgeries just to stabilize me. Oh my and, God. Uh, yeah, yeah. But, but at the time, I didn't know anything had happened. I really didn't. Because immediately I was brought to this beautiful place, a place that I call the place between here and there. And that's the topic of our book, which is on Amazon. And, uh, and it was deeply rooted in my regular life. But as time went on, I started to notice uh, things were a little bit different. And, uh, and one of the first th places I was, was in what I call a workplace setting. And it's where I learned what I call the language of the universe. And what I mean is that there are certain truths about life and about existence. And, uh, and in this place, I was taught to understand what these certain truths are. The first thing is I was taught is how to see the spirit in everybody and everything. And the way I was taught this is that I was seeing people from my life, just as I remember them. Some people I hadn't seen in decades, but they were just as I remember them. And then there were some people who I saw yesterday and they were just as I remembered them. They hadn't aged any, any at all. And I thought that was odd. And for some reason, it didn't like connect with, with me, like, like what's going on, Stephen? I was just kind of like just going with the flow of things. And well, then I would- you that, Let me ask you this, um, just so that I can give our listeners a better picture, Steve. So when you had this horrible accident, did you feel right before you, the truck hit you like a, oh no, oh my God. And then did you just have a life's review or how did you step into this other world place. Gotcha. I didn't know I was in an accident. I was just in this other place. I didn't know anything happened at all. It was just like my life and it was very deeply rooted in my life. So I didn't remember I was on a motorcycle. I was in this work-like setting and it just seemed like regular life to me. 
it didn't seem like anything. I didn't see any lights. I didn't see any higher spirits at this time or anything I recognized as a higher spirit. I was just very, very in what I term as a work-like setting. Well, was this more like a life review, like going through a catalog of all the people in your life that you've had encounters with? Not yet. That did happen. But, but at this point is mm -hmm. that I was learning the language of the universe and said, in the sense that, that I was being prepared for my life review to get me in the best state of mind to get the most mm -hmm. out of my life review. And so, uh, and so that was the purpose of this first place, is learning the language of the universe, teaching to see spirit in people, because that was one of the first lessons I had to learn prior to going through a life review. My gosh, I mean, that is just monumental. So you actually felt like when you're in this environment, this workplace, you actually felt, Steve, that it was normal. Yes, 100% normal. I felt wow. nothing different. So what happened after that? Well, what, what, what happened is then I started to see people who I knew is, as adults, I started to see them as children. And then people who I knew as children, I started to see them as adults. People who I knew as men, I started seeing them as women. And people who I knew as women, I started to see as men. I started to see all the people that I knew in different shapes and forms and, science, so, uh, and different appearances. And what I knew is as I learned more and more, I learned to recognize that part of them which isn't attached to their physical body. I learned to see their spirit. And regardless of what form they took, I knew it was the person. Because that, I began to become in tune to the spirit, that part of you that lives forever, that part of you that was never born, never dies, is... is incarnated and uh, lives forever in both this plane and the place between here and there and any place that may come afterwards. I was being taught to see the spirit. That was the primary uh, lesson that I learned in the first step in that place. What a, a beautiful gift. So um, I got a question I know the listeners are going to want to have an answer to. When you saw a person that you knew and you saw their different um, appearances. Were, were you, was that their past lives? You know, at this point, um, I could tell you that I'm not sure. Is that at this point, I just didn't know. I mean, I, I know later on other things became clear to me, but it just looked like I was being taught a lesson is that these people were here. And yes, I would say that uh, now that, that, that we talk about it, I, yes, it was most likely from their different existences or what is to be to become what they will become but uh, everyone has their their meaning for being there it's not a show for stevie is is that they are there for their own purposes and i am there for my own purposes yes, yes, for your education. And so, exactly and so uh and so yes that's quite possible now um what was the second leg of your journey Okay, so, so once I was taught um, to see the spear, spirit, I started to feel, I didn't need to see it anymore. I could just feel the spirit in everybody and everything. And then I began to understand that everything, everything had a spirit, regardless of what it was, if it was an animal or the plants or everything had a spirit. And, uh, and once I was able to see the spirit, I was able to sense the spirit in everything. And then I was realized that everything is connected. Everything shares a spirit. This spirit is one spirit. And all of, all of these things are connected very much the way a cells in a body are connected. And you could think of it like, uh, like each cell in your body, it has its own life. It, it eats, it rests, it reproduces, and it's unaware of the consciousness of you. And that's the way all the spirits in the universe work, is that we're all separate spirits, but all the spirits together make up a consciousness. And that consciousness is the consciousness of the creator. The creator and the creation are one. They aren't different. That was one of the most important lessons I learned when I grew up as a Catholic in Catholic school. 
in Catholic school is that I was taught that uh, uh, God was everywhere. And I thought that, what was God? Was it a, uh, was he peeping in every corner? You know, as a little Catholic boy, like, do I have to look over my shoulder? Or, or, was, it, um, or was it that uh, God is everything? That's why God is everywhere, because God is you, God is me, God's are the plants, God's is the sky, the creator and the creation are one. And this was the, the second monumental thing that I learned in that other place. Well, that is, that is what exactly what my listeners want to know, the, the, the devil is in the details. Now, um, after this revelation, what was the next step that you took? Well, the next step I took was um, was uh, uh, that that I had my life review, mm -hmm. and and what this was is that I lived my life all over again. Every scene, it wasn't that I was it wasn't that I was in my body. I was like a voyeur looking at the scene. I yeah. couldn't influence the scene at all. I was just there, but, but one of the first things that now I saw the spirit in everything, now as I lived through my life, is that I was able to see the spirit in everybody there. And then once I could see the spirit in everyone there, I understood why each person was there. Like a fight in the playground is that, is that I had my reason for being there because this guy was a bleep, bleepity bleep and blank and blank. And, but he had his reasons for being there and he thought the same of me. And then I started to realize is that, is that everything in life has multiple meanings. There, there is the overt meaning that is very equal to being on this plane of existence. Like for instance, you go to work, you're at work because you have to earn money. But then there are interactions there that have nothing to do with that. It has to go with a deeper meaning, meaning that, that there, are, there are dual meanings for almost everything in life. One is a physical meaning and one is a spiritual meaning. And, uh, and uh, that's what I began to learn there is that, is that as going through my life review is that I learned all about my experiences and what had happened in life. And that, and that really brought to, to um, the forefront the idea that, that experiences are everything. They are everything in life because that, that is what you rely on on your life review. Each time I reviewed my life and I was done with it, I felt bliss. I felt so happy. And it wasn't because of there were pretty skies or anything, although there were. The reason why I felt so happy is that I evolved as a spirit, as a person. I began, uh, I, I don't know how to, how to explain it, but imagine a place where you had no hate or animosity towards anybody and no one had any hate or animosity towards you. You just had peace, love and life and all those those things it just made you feel better and then what what would happen is now i would have been my awareness has been raised and so i would do another life review and i would live through all my life again and i'd learn new lessons from the same situation and when i was done i would be i was more enlightened and then i kept on going through this process of doing my life review rising from it becoming more enlightened and then keep on doing it again and i did that time and time again it wasn't that i was choosing to do the life review it wasn't that i was choosing it it was and, or it wasn't that there was a consciousness above us that was causing this to happen. It was almost, it was, the need was driving the process. As long as I could learn from my mistakes and the things that I've been through, the more I will relive them until I stop learning them. And how many times I went through this life review, I don't know, but it was definitely a lot closer to infinity than it was to one. And, uh, and that was one of the most important things because as part of that life review, I touched on it a little bit before, that experiences are everything. And so what I learned is some of the worst experiences in my life were some of the experiences that I learned the most from and that I got the most bliss from. I mean, I, everyone has had beautiful things and terrible things in life and you get so caught up with the terrible things in life or have guilt and animosity towards yourself 
self or shame. And those are the things that people take with them and never let go. But what I learned is that those things cause blockages and prevent you from really learning from your experiences. So once you're able to break from your experiences, learn from them and leave that shame and, and regret behind and don't have any animosity towards anybody or anything or hatred, you'll feel such a sense of bliss and you'll be able to see the true meaning in everything that you've experienced. And what a relief for you to let go of the, the terrible, awful and take the lesson and incorporate that into your uh, psyche. So I have an interesting question now here, Steve, and I thought about it a lot. You were in the coma three weeks and we all know that, well, we should know that linear time is not applicable in an out of body state. Would you say it, you felt like, uh, could you, did it feel like you were there for weeks, months, hours? Long? Okay, okay. <laughs> this is a really good question. I'm going to do my best to explain it. Is that there, was, there wasn't time or days in like the traditional sense, meaning that what is time? Well, well, if a pot boils on a stove, you, you can see it wasn't boiling, now it's boiling, or you have an appointment in the future. Uh, you have to go to work tomorrow, or someone's birthday is, or the sun rises and sun sets. There isn't anything like that. The way time is measured is by your experiences and your growth. If, you, if you're not doing anything, time goes so slow. But, but, but if you're getting value, if you're going through your life reviews, if you're embracing what you're going through with an excitement and you're really learning from the bliss, it goes very fast. The more you learn, the more you do, the faster time goes. And so, uh, and so, and so how do you view your time in that place? It's not days, it's that you think back to your state of mind that you were, you know, 10 lessons ago and you think, wow, how much I've grown since then. That gives you the idea of passing of time is your personal growth through your, these experiences that you experienced that you sense the passage of time. But, but it could have happened in a microsecond or could have happened in a hundred years. I don't know, except for the fact that, uh, that I was never bored. I was always excited. I always had a sense of bliffs. There were challenges, but, but, but really everything was about learning. Did you and growing? Feel, see, that is wonderful. Um, did you feel that you were traveling or you were in one place? Okay, so so I didn't walk from place to place. I didn't choose where to go. I didn't go home to a house and sleep or eat or do anything like that. I just was. I was in one place and I was interacting interacting with what was going on. And the way I would describe it is picture a play. You have a play and you have the scene is set. And then on the set, this action is gonna take place, but it's all improv. It's, it, it's that there are likely outcomes, but, but, but really I just go from scene to scene and deal with ever in that scene. I don't choose where to go, I just am. Yes, yes, that is extremely well, you're well spoken. You're a very good explainer, Steve. Um, were you reunited? Did you have uh, uh, deceased relatives or friends that you were in, reunited and able to communicate with? In a very big way. And, uh, and I, I, I wanted, I need to get to that. But, but I'd like to just mention, can I mention just a other few quick oh, things this is your about shot. that initial experience is that, um, is, is that another thing is that I realized besides that experiences are everything and not to have hate or animosity towards anybody or anything for bringing you bad things. Another thing is I learned is don't have any judgment on other people for the choices that they've made in life. I don't mean like, like, like you being a loop person and say, oh, I'm not going to judge because I'm so evolved. No, I don't mean that. I mean by judge is that everybody has their own meaning for life, their own things that they have to do in life, their own lessons that they have to learn. It's not your place to get involved or to change that unless called upon. You, you know, whatever happens, if someone is going to be a nuclear scientist or they're going to be an actor or they're, they're going to be a computer guy or they're going to be a police officer, well, whatever they choose in life, whatever greatness or 
poor choices they make. That's important to them. That's why they're here. That's why they're here to learn. So, so that's one of the main things I learned is don't have any judgments towards other people because that you're, you're missing the points and the meaning of life. Exactly. Another, exactly. Yes. Another important thing is I learned is that, is that your inner teacher is your only teacher. People can sh show you things or even tell you things, but it's not until your inside, your inner teacher is able to understand it and communicate to it. And that was very important because a lot of times in my life when teaching somebody is I would show them the lesson and, and I'll say, did you learn it? Did you learn it? Here's a test. But like, for instance, when I was taught about spirit, someone didn't sit down and say, Stevie, here's spirit. Go ahead, take a look at it. This is the way it works. No, they showed me my friends and people who I knew in different shapes and forms. And I figured that out myself. It's because that I relied on my inner teacher. So that was another very important thing I learned there. Um, so and what you're uh, saying is we have to experience things for ourselves to truly learn. Exactly, and with that, you get the wisdom to use the knowledge. If somebody just tells you, it's kind of like a kid finding, uh, finding his, his parent's gun in the top drawer and they start waving it around, they don't have the knowledge. Is, is that really you need the knowledge mm -hmm. to, uh, to, uh, to the wisdom to use it? You have to learn it on yourself. That learning process gives you the wisdom to, uh, to use that knowledge. You know, what I find exceptional about this is that you were able to take the vivid experiences, the memories, and able to process it, and to, you brought it back with you. So I think that is remarkable, and that's why people should, you know, listeners, go out and buy The, the Place Between Here and There by Stephen Weber, because it's a beautiful near-death experience story, and it's very enlightening. So is this the end of your experience and then you came no. back or was there more? No, 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 a lot more. I know we, we have limited time, so I've, uh, I've, I've given you the... And, and all the more reason to uh, to get the book. Uh, it's on, available on Amazon because I go into a lot more detail. But I'm just touching on these really important button points because that yes. it's like uh, you and I had talked about in our earlier conversations is that is that it's about the spirit world, but it's also about this world. It's lessons you've learned there that, that, that you can take into this world that'll, that'll bring, you, bring you peace and prosperity here. It's not just about those other places. All these lessons that I learned, once I learned them and I came back and I started to apply them to my life, my life, it wasn't bad before, but my life really took off in such a positive direction just by the way that I changed and the way I thought about things, the way I treated people. It brought me bliss in this world and any world which may come after it well i think that's a message that kind of resonates with near-death experiencers because you know people can read our books and listen to us but it's a great thing because we're all going to have that final destination you know nobody lives forever we don't get out of uh, uh of this world alive and to have a book like yours it's going to make the journey a lot easier when when people cross over Knowledge is everything and understanding how the non-physical reality is. It's just such a wonderful gift that you are, are sharing with us, with me today and uh, to your readers. So Thank you. let's get kind of to the meat and potatoes. Okay. Of, so uh, four, can tell me four big things that you brought back after your near-death experience. Okay. So, um, so, one very important, uh, very important thing that I learned is the next place I was in in that place was I was being tested on the knowledge that I learned. And I didn't know that at the time is that I was in, I was in another work like setting where I was mentoring children on how to do the tasks of, uh, of the workplace, but I wasn't there for that. I didn't realize it at the time is that I was really there. These were spirits who have yet to have a human incarnation and I was being there to mentor them to show them how to how to be a human how to have a human experience but anytime I was alone with the kids I called them is that they would scatter and they wouldn't listen to me and I just couldn't reach them I couldn't understand 
why they wouldn't listen to me. And, uh, and it wasn't until the bar owner touched me and I realized and I saw in the bar owner, I saw myself as if the bar owner was actually my higher self because this place was, was a uh, restaurant, a bar and grill restaurant. And I was being hired there to guide these children. And so when I spoke to the owner to tell them the trouble I was having, the owner touched me. And then all of a sudden I saw the kids in a different way. I was taught how to see spirit, but the first time I had an opportunity to use my knowledge of spirit by seeing the kids as I didn't see their spirit. I just saw them as kids. And that was important important lesson that I took back at, at with me is that when you're walking through life is is try to get in contact with people's spirit don't don't get so mesmerized by their physical form you're missing so many things the spirit is everything once you start to see people spirit, you can start to really understand what motivates them, what makes them happy, the things you should avoid, the things that you should encourage. By mentoring these children in that spot, by failing at first, then learning how to use spirit, that, that I was able to mentor them for what I would consider what I believed was their human incarnation. Because that taught me a very important lesson about the spirit. You think of your spirit as you, but I think what happens is your spirit evolves over time through different incarnations. You may be incarnated as different animals and plants, and, and human is one of the top incarnations. And these, these spirits who I was with is really, I was there to mentor them, to prepare them for a human incarnation. And uh, that was one of the uh, important things that I took back with me is the once I learned how to spirit, see spirit is that I remembered to look for spirit in the people who I was dealing with. Well, that's, that's very moving. Now, I'd like to ask you something personal. Mm -hmm. I know that you have lost a child and there is mm -hmm. no greater heartbreak than uh, losing a child. And I'm so sorry, but can you share, are you comfortable sharing some of your views about this experience and the person that really perpetuated the loss. Thank you. Yes, I, I wanted that it is so important. A lot of times when people uh, seek out the book, it's about a near death experience, but really the people who contact the most are people who've lost a loved one and is are really struggling to, uh, to come to terms with that. And, uh, and my son, he was just a beautiful, beautiful young man. He, he was a musician, an artist, a, an athlete, a scholar student. He just got caught in some bad company and it was just a short period. And I found him one morning, I died of a drug overdose in my basement. And uh, it was, it was, it was awful. It was, he was my life, my kids. I was a stay at home dad. I worked at, from an office in my house and it was like, it, it, I, I don't know how to explain it. And I went to this very deep funk for, for many months. But, but with the help of a friend of mine is for the longest time after having this experience, I didn't think it was real. A after I woke up in my hospital room, is I thought it was the drugs. I thought I was dreaming. I didn't think it was real. And so I kind of like put it in the back of my mind. I put it in the back of my mind and I didn't think about it. And I was just focusing on how to get better, how to raise myself from the condition that I was in and just be able to walk and talk and to do things. And so, and so I kind of forgot about it, but it wasn't until my friend one day said to me, you know, has my son tried to contact me? And I thought, I thought she was out of her mind. I thought like, like, what is she? You know, th this was a person who I was, well, I was friends with for many years, for 20 years, we were moms together. <laughs> you know, I was, uh, I was since, since I was Mr. Mom, all my friends were other mothers. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought she was nuts. But, but, but then over a period of time talking about it, I started to rely more and more upon those lessons. And I started to realize that perhaps this wasn't a dream. Perhaps it wasn't the drugs. Perhaps this really did happen to me, and there's a purpose for it. That that now, when confronted with the death of my son, that that now being in this situation, I can see it. I mean, it's something that that's with me forever. But 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 now I know. And the first time, as I 
cross that bridge into feeling better about things is I thought to myself, is he in the place where I was? Because I tell you, I didn't want to come back. I mean, I knew my, my place where it was here, but I loved that place. I did not want, it was beautiful. It was blissful. And, uh, and as soon as I began to realize with, with the help of my friend, I started to realize that perhaps he was in that place too. All of a sudden I started to feel better about things. And I started to let the grief move through my heart and more that I let the grief leave me, the more I was rewarded with this beautiful peace and love and light that I remembered from having my son with me, even in the bad times is that all of a sudden, that came back to me like I lost it for a while and that was part of the grief is that losing the person but but you also lost your memory of them you've lost the physical aspect of them but but you've also lost the memory of them because that's replaced by such terrible thoughts now to have all that erased and to realize that they're happy and I'm going to be happy and everything's okay. All those experiences that I shunned that brought me grief now came back in a beautiful bliss and just really made me so happy in a sense like, like I wish he was here, but that he isn't, it's okay. I'm okay. He's okay. We're going to be together someday and not even in the way that we are now in our full spirit and our higher self that encompasses all of our incarnations, everything that we are. These were all things that helped me prepare for this situation. And with the help of my friend who also happens to be my co-author and the love of my life now, um, that, uh, that I really, uh, it really enabled me to, um, to, to really make this connection. And um, and one question that, that that people often ask is that, uh, go ahead. No, what is that question that people ask you? Is that, do I have any hate or animosity towards the, the person who sold, gave my son the drugs? The poison that and, killed him. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Do you? And the answer is zero. What I want, what I want more than anything, you know, society, he has to, he has to be responsible for the things that he's done and society has its own plan. But for me, is that there's nothing I want more for that kid to, and he, and he is a young man too, is to, is to pay his crime to society, to pay his debt, but to someday have an opportunity to get out of prison, to be able to learn, to be able to have a wife of his own, to be able to have a kid, to bring him to bring him to music lessons and school and to, and to enjoy all those things and perhaps get married I mean, and to have, have his kid and go through high school and, and college and, and have a wife and kids and grandchildren. I want him to have those things. I want him to make something of himself. I want his life to be good. I want him, I want him to, to come to terms with what he's did, have remorse, have his learning, but I want him to learn and grow and live life and make something of this human incarnation. I don't know, I can't judge his path in life, I don't know. But, but at the very least, as I said, you can't judge is that, is that there's meaning for everything. And if this fella can find meaning in life, that'll bring me peace. Near death experiencers like myself and you, and other authors that I've interviewed have had this one uh, thing resonate is that they are certain and we are certain that there's a continuous, there's a continuation of life after death. Continuation of consciousness, yes. Continuation of existence, which is I think the lifeline to our sanity after going through a near-death experience. This is what we seem to bring back have you, I know you agree with that, but have you had any uh, psychic, increased psychic abilities after your NDE? Well, a couple of things is that, um, is that first off is that um, I'm now open to signs and synchronicities where I wasn't open to signs at, before. And actually it was receiving signs from, from the spirit world that first got me to understand and that, that this wasn't a dream, that it was real. One of the first signs that I received early on that, that changed my mind is that uh, my friend and I, we created a little memorial in the woods for my son, and uh, we named it after St. Teresa. That's a Catholic saint. And 
why we picked St. Teresa, I don't know, but, but, but we just picked her and we would place flowers there. We'd place uh, like a pen for people to write on. And after the first day we came back, there were like 30 stones with prayers written on it for people just, and it just took off and people kept on leaving prayer stones at our little woodland shrine and saying uh, prayers for lost loved ones or asking for, for healing or other things. It was a beautiful thing. We'd often come across people um, at that place. And, uh, and so one day, uh, uh, we, we went to go down there. My, uh, my, my love, Kathy, uh, co-author, she was finding flowers all over the place. And she said, this was signs from spirit. And I, I told her, I didn't think so. And, uh, and what had happened was a psychic friend of ours gave us a card and said, uh, St. Teresa, who we named this, uh, the shrine after and Nick have a spiritual connection and she gave us the card and we looked on the card and the day that St. Teresa was born was the day that my son was born and the day St. Teresa was canonized was the day my son died and uh, and to see like a synchronicity like that in such a strong way I think to myself what are the odds of something like that happen exactly it, yeah it is just you know it if one of those things happened, I would be, okay, well, you know, fluky things happen. But to have both of those things happen, it just really began to open up my, my eyes that perhaps there is a communication that is possible and synchronicities. So like, for instance, um, signs. Uh, well, I see signs all the time. There, there are two factors with signs is that you have to get past the wow factor. And what I mean by, by, by that is when you receive a sign and you think it's a sign, you know, try to stay away from saying, wow, oh, wow, I got a sign because that's almost distracts you. Try to drill down into the meaning of what a sign is and to follow the path that it's giving you. It's giving you guidance for yourself, but most often for someone else too. And I'll give you a perfect example, is that, uh, is that Kathy and I were walking down the beach and it's in the middle of the COVID epidemic. And she says that she was, uh, she was doing Reiki, Reiki healing for the world. And so, uh, so if it wasn't for Kathy, things would be a lot worse. But, um, but, but, but she walks on the beach and she does this healing in her mind to try to heal the world and help everybody. She's very good hearted. And so she asked for a sign from, uh, from uh, 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 a saint of uh, Violet Beach Glass, the Violet Beach Glass, the Violet Flame of St. Germain. And so she wanted to find Violet Beach Glass on the beach. And we walked all day. We didn't find anything. She was very disappointed. On the way out, we saw this lady. She was walking a Dalmatian, you know, those dogs with all the little black spots on it. We said hello. And, and Kathy asked what the dog's name was. And she said the dog's name was Violet. And, and Kathy was, oh, Violet. Violet. And so we, we walked away and Kathy was like, isn't that nice, a dog named Violet? And I was like, Kathy, it's a sign. Don't you see it? You, you know, of, of all the things that could happen is, is that the dog's name is Violet. It's not a Violet dog. It's a Dalmatian. How could a dog be named Violet? You were asking for a sign, a Violet beach glass, but you got a vi dog named Violet. Do you, don't you see there's something crazy about this, something that the universe is trying to tell us? And after a while, she, she was like, yeah, but I still wanted the beach class. <laughs> but but so, so, so that was, was, was it. And then, but I said to her, we have to find this lady. And, uh, and so we were walking there a few months, a few weeks later, and lo and behold, the lady's walking there with, with her dog. And Kathy goes running up to her, you know, tells her our story and, and why the dog is named Ms. Violet. And as it so happens, she named the dog uh, for her son, um, and uh, uh, because of his 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 connection with the violet flame as well. And he died under cer similar circumstances oh my as my son. And and so we we became good friends, and we began to talk and and do things together. And and I could tell is that is that no that was that was the sign is that the universe was reaching out to us to show us a sign that we had to connect with this person. We had this synchrony. There was a way of us coming together and helping each other. I thought I was there to help her, but and, and I was, but she was also there to help me. That's the way that so many of these signs and synchronicities work is that okay. is that everybody, it's a dual meaning. Every interaction is for the benefit of all of those people.
people involved. You just have to look and see. And so those are a couple examples of how when connecting to spirit that, that once I opened up my heart to seeing things, I'm, a, I'm an engineer. So, so two plus two equals four and nothing else counts. I had to be able to put that aside and say that counts, but so does spirit count. They're all part. They explain the same wor a world. What an, engineering, uh, what, what an engineer is to the physical world, a psychic is to the spiritual world. Can you tell me, um, do you have any speaking engagements ahead of you? Well, uh, currently, right, right, right now, we're working on releasing our Spanish version of the book. And I speak very regularly, almost every week in, uh, in different formats and podcasts and live appearances. Uh, prior to the, uh, the epidemic, I spoke every week in front of live audiences. And we're going to get back to that soon, as soon as they begin to lift the, uh, the COVID restrictions. Um, we do have a, a workshop uh, November 7th at uh, Long Island Healing Arts Center. We're going to be doing a, a sound uh, ascension. We're going to bring our gongs down and we're going to uh, play the gongs uh, to uh, help people raise to a higher vibration and per perhaps connect themselves with that place between between here and there. And I'll be doing crystal readings. I'll have a bag and I'll, and I'll hold the bag out for people to, um, to uh, take a, a, a crystal from. And then I'll read the crystal and, and tell them what the crystal tells me about themselves to perhaps give them some guidance. And so this is uh, at the Long Island Healing Arts Center in Long Island. And so, but if you, um, if you have any questions, uh, uh, you, you know, just, just send us a note at uh, info, I-N-F-O at betweenhereandthere.org, info at between here and the, between here and there dot org info and and we'll send you information on this workshop it's beautiful it's all free and we'll be signing books and uh and so uh come down the long island healing arts centers in long island new york it's uh, right in huntington on um, the ending question is this steve what can the reader what is the most important message the one most important message in your book life is good and people are good even when very sad things happen. If you could find out why this is so, you will be happy in life. You will, no matter what happens, you'll find happiness and meaning in life. Life is good and people are good, even when very sad things happen. There's so much, there is a beautiful place, but here's a beautiful place too. It's so true. Live life. The meaning of life is to live it. Don't be a, a guru on a mountain and live on three pieces of rice a day, hoping you'll get in touch with the spirit. I don't think for me, that isn't what life's about. Life is to experience life, to live life, to have relationships, to have grief, to have happiness. These are all the things that are so important when you do your life review. Your life review is everything because that's where you ascend from. That's where you get your knowledge and your spiritual growth. You need material for thought. That's what the purpose of life is. So in short, you know, and Steve never says anything in short, but life is good and people are good even when very sad things happen. Well, I think uh, Mr. Weber, Mr. Stephen Weber, Great author, wonderful human, humanitarian. Um, I hope that my listeners will go out and buy the, the place between here and there. Thank you for being on Near Death TV. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity. And I wish everybody peace and love and, uh, and, find, and find your meaning, your path in life. Peace. Excellent. Thank you for listening. The Near Death Saga Books, Near Death Connection, Throwaway Horses, and Reincarnation Connection can all be found on Amazon. Or you can go to theneardeathsaga.com to read book previews. For more Near Death TV interviews, go to neardeathtv.com. Thank you. <laughs>